Pornography is one of the greatest, but at the same time most overlooked, problems of the modern world. If you're skeptical of this, keep listening, because today we're going to be exploring exactly how pornography destroys your mind. Firstly, let's look at some basic statistics. Since the expansion of the internet in the early 2000s, exposure to pornography has reached levels never seen before in history. 25% of all daily web searches are pornographic. The average age that most people first see pornography is 11 years old. Children under the age of 10 make up 22% of online porn consumption for those under 18. Keep those statistics in mind, because we're going to go over how much pornography can damage an adult's mind, let alone the developing mind of a child. Like many of those watching, I was exposed to pornography at a young age. When I, as a teenager, researched the effects of pornography use, I was told by many websites that it was simply harmless and would have no negative effects. But, the truth is, there are well-documented and scientifically verified negatives to these habits, and porn organizations go to tremendous lengths to either hide or downplay these things to the general public. For the purposes of this video, the term pornography use refers to individuals watching or masturbating to pornography, and citations for all of the facts presented here will be available in the description. The way pornography attracts and hooks viewers is by exploiting the body's dopamine response to sexual stimulation. This natural response is intended to make humans seek to reproduce, but pornography transforms it into a desire to view more pornography. This is why, as the phrase goes, sex sells. It's why so many people become hooked on pornography for years, if not their entire lives. The effect of dopamine from viewing pornography is very similar to the dopamine effects of addictive drugs such as methamphetamine. Advocates for pornography like to argue that it's simply natural to view it, but there's never been anything natural about masturbating to two people having sex on a screen. Before diving straight into pornography's effects, we need to investigate how it went from something illegal to something that can be accessed from every computer. Most modern people are under the illusion that pornography is an eternal fact of life, an ancient, perennial aspect of human history. This perception is a result of carefully curated propaganda and marketing campaigns that have been orchestrated by extremely wealthy and powerful people. Pornographers and their cohorts have scoured and harvested the past for anything and everything that depicts or comments on human sexuality bastardizing it all with no regard for its original intent or purpose. Pornhub even used the Venus of Willendorf, a 25,000-year-old fertility goddess idol, as evidence of vintage, so-called pornography. In reality, pornography is a relatively new phenomenon, barely 200 years old. During the initial underground rise of pornography, most Western countries had anti-obscenity laws in place, prohibiting the production and distribution of pornographic or obscene materials. Less than 100 years ago, those producing pornography would be thrown in jail. Similar laws are still in place in many countries in the world today, and in fact, pornography is currently illegal in more countries than it is legal. After the end of the Second World War, Western obscenity laws were gradually broken down, largely through the collaborative efforts of liberals and Western Marxists. These attacks on obscenity law coincided with attacks on the concept of race and gender. Denmark was the first country to officially legalize pornography in 1969, and other Western nations soon followed suit. To this day, the sexual revolution of the 1960s and 70s is championed by the mainstream as one of the most so-called liberating acts of emancipation in human history. In the US, pornography was legalized primarily via two Supreme Court cases involving a pair of pornographers, Roth v. United States and Miller v. California. In layman's terms, these cases rendered obscenity laws obsolete by loosening the legal definition of obscenity to the point that it became meaningless. The legalization of pornography took place under the Warren Court, which also outlawed state-sponsored prayer in schools, and laid the foundation for the legalization of abortion, contraception, sodomy, and same-sex marriage, among other things. Of course, invalidating obscenity laws went against the will of the American public and government, but the courts and multiple NGOs ensured it happened all the same. In the modern day, online porn is dominated by a single, highly secretive, monopolistic company, MindGeek, which owns a variety of major publishing and production companies, including Pornhub, RedTube, YouPorn, etc. 
An even more socially damaging aspect of modern pornography are websites like OnlyFans that are targeted towards young women and encourage them to become self-employed amateur porn stars. With the breakdown of society accelerating particularly in the last 10 years, these so-called sex workers have their paychecks filled by lonely, sexually starved men, both young and old. Some might call these men simps. The simp and the porn star have perhaps the most unhealthy mutual relationship in the entire online world, where each views the other as simply a means to a nefarious end. Now, it's critical to note that without the pornography mega-platforms and the mass marketing campaigns behind them, most people doing these things would have never gone down that path. This is especially apparent when you see teenage girls making OnlyFans accounts as soon as they become 18. And while we're on the topic of the porn industry, let's delve a bit further. Pornography websites are rife with abusive and inhumane videos. Human trafficking, pedophilia, rape, sex slavery, and bestiality. In late 2019, a man was even arrested for posting pornographic videos on Pornhub of him raping a missing teenage girl. Pornhub had monetized the videos until public outcry forced them to stop it. But even afterwards, similar cases continue to happen. It's gone to the point that the site has earned the nickname Trafficking Hub due to how many human traffickers post and get monetized there. On websites like Reddit, community managers from Pornhub encourage users not to report illegal activity on the website to the FBI. There are many more stories about companies like this out there. They are evil. Now that we understand the history of pornography and the industry around pornography, it's finally time to speak about its effects. While presenting information to the U.S. Senate, Scientists describe pornography as similarly addictive as crack, and pornography addiction has been identified by scientists to function nearly identically to drug addiction. A 2015 study titled Neuroscience of Internet Pornography Addiction, a Review and Update, states this. The review leads to the conclusion that internet pornography addiction fits into the addiction framework and shares similar mechanisms with substance addiction. Neuroscientists have also stated that pornography hijacks the regular functions of men's brains and has a major impact on their thoughts and lives. Unfortunately, many in the medical industrial complex and mainstream media like to claim that individuals are only addicted to pornography if they're unable to resist viewing it in situations such as at work or in public. This faulty logic completely falls through when we apply it to other forms of addiction. Are you not an alcoholic as long as you don't drink on the job? Can someone not be addicted to drugs unless they do it in public? A far better measure to verify whether someone is addicted to pornography is to see if they can abstain from it for as long as possible. If they fail to abstain for longer than a few days, they are likely addicted. Other signs of addiction include instinctively or mindlessly seeking out lewd images on social media, or telling yourself that you can quit anytime you want, you just don't want to quit right now. Someone repeating these mantras to themselves is a form of subconscious rationalization used to justify their biological addiction. When one looks at the incredibly high frequency of pornography use in the adult population, it wouldn't be unreasonable to suggest that pornography addiction is one of the most grotesquely underdiagnosed disorders in the modern world. As for pornography's other major effects, they break down into two main categories, cognitive and behavioral. These effects have some overlap, but we'll start with the cognitive. Firstly, and perhaps most importantly, frequent internet porn use has been linked to the brain being less receptive to dopamine. As psychiatrist and psychoanalyst Norman Doidge writes in his book, The Brain That Changes Itself, although people's brains are fully developed by the age of 25, they continually change and grow throughout your lifetime. The brain physically adapts to new knowledge and lifestyle choices, including bad habits, by rewriting itself and forming new neural pathways and erasing old ones. This is known as neuroplasticity. Our brain's neural pathways are reinforced via regular usage. As someone uses internet pornography on a regular basis, the brain is receiving continuous, extreme blasts of dopamine that required little to no effort to achieve. This, in turn, makes it less receptive to the chemical. As a result, other research has linked frequent internet porn use to hypofrontality, which destroys your memory and is associated with ADHD and depression, and some research has even linked it to the loss of the vital brain tissue, gray matter. Now, onto behavioral effects. 
The first notable behavioral effect of frequent internet porn use is the buildup of tolerance, or desensitization, to regular sex acts. This results in porn users, over time, seeking out more and more extreme or novel types of porn to get the same sexual high. In a study by two American professors, titled, Does Deviant Pornography Use Follow a Gutman-like Progression? It was found that the longer individuals had used porn in their life, the more likely they were to deliberately seek out child pornography or bestiality. This is in part due to the aforementioned overstimulation of dopamine to the brain that's caused by pornography use. There is also evidence that suggests that some people's feelings of homosexuality and transsexuality can be linked to porn-caused desensitization. And it doesn't even end there. Those who masturbate to online porn are far more likely to develop erectile dysfunction and report significantly more difficulty getting aroused by a real-life partner. Tellingly, rates of erectile dysfunction today are at historic highs and have been rising every decade. Furthermore, porn users are far more likely to believe that sexually aggressive or deviant acts are normal. And this normalization of sexual aggression is linked to higher rates of committing sexually aggressive acts. As we would expect, when something is normalized in a person's mind, they're far more likely to engage in it. This fact is even more insidious when we consider that some influential people have recently suggested that giving pedophiles simulated child pornography will somehow protect children from being abused. Finally, we need to talk about porn's connection to divorce. Many believe that pornography somehow helps marriages, but the numbers reflect anything but. Around 60% of divorce cases report that pornography was a significant issue. Further, research has found that porn-free relationships have higher levels of commitment and lower levels of infidelity. The conclusions were that pornography can encourage an individual to seek adulterous activities regardless of whether they're happy or satisfied in a relationship. Now there's a few other pornography myths that are worth debunking. No, masturbation does not reduce your chances of prostate cancer. The studies on that subject are contradictory at best, with some even finding higher rates of prostate cancer in frequent masturbators. If you're actually trying to reduce prostate cancer, proven methods are having a healthy diet. No, the availability of pornography is not why rates of crime have decreased. As was previously mentioned, pornography increases feelings of sexual aggression, not lowers them. Further, we can look at the so-called golden age of pornography to see this. During this time, between 1969 and 1984, pornography experienced unprecedented exposure and commercial success. And during that same time period, US crime rates rose to extreme levels. The drop in crime rate since the 1990s has been explained by experts as a wide variety of factors that have nothing to do with pornography. And finally, it's often claimed by pro-pornography sources that pornography can reduce stress. But pornography's effect on stress is similar to that of marijuana. It may provide some relief in the short term, but its long-term chemical effects on the brain produce more stress, not less. Again, ways to actually reduce stress are things like listening to relaxing music or exercising. Now, on a lighter note, the good news for pornography users is that you can still quit. Many of the negative effects talked about in this video can be reversed if someone spends enough time abstained from pornography. Other good habits to pick up after quitting porn are things like fixing your diet, starting to exercise every day, taking up creative hobbies, and things like that. There will be some resources in the description to help those who are truly trying to quit, including the PMO Hackbook. Quitting porn of course won't fix all of your problems, but it's an excellent improvement to make. So finally, it's time to speak about what can actually be done to stop this porn problem that's plaguing our civilization. Fortunately, there is some bipartisan agreement that pornography is a problem. The most recent Gallup poll that measured people's moral views on pornography showed a strong majority who believe it's morally impermissible. Unfortunately, with the way the United States government works, this issue is still in the hands of the Supreme Court. As long as they continue to view pornography as so-called free speech, it will be incredibly hard to pass legislation against it. Now you might be thinking that the courts have too much power, and that this undermines the will of the people and the other branches of government. And you'd be right. Judicial supremacy is one of the worst things to happen to the United States. However, regardless of this, those who know the truth about pornography should continue to raise awareness and to make sure that as many people as possible, especially those in positions of power, know these truths and are pushed to take action. Who knows, if every Supreme Court justice saw this video, perhaps they would reconsider their view of pornography and thus make rulings accordingly.
One thing is certain though, as long as this problem continues unaddressed, our civilization will continue its downward trajectory and the lives of hundreds of millions, potentially billions, will continue to be negatively affected by porn. Those who say that banning pornography wouldn't have much effect severely underestimate the impact that having legal penalties for pornographers and shutting down their mega platforms would have. If these things were done, you'd find that the pornography industry would dry up very quickly. The final point I would like to make is to point out how the over-sexualization of our society is not simply a result of the porn industry alone. The mainstream media, as well as academia, continue to buy into the sexual revolution's myth that sexual liberation and licentiousness are the true meaning of freedom. They continue to adamantly oppose the value of traditional sexual morality. Thus, in order for society to become healthier, these institutions as well must have their courses corrected. During the course of making this video, I was actually pleasantly surprised to see several high-profile YouTubers doing nofap. Nofap being the common term online to refer to avoiding porn. I'm on nofap because I wanted to end enslavement to myself. I wanted to be in complete control of every decision that I make. Nofap changed my life. I said it once and I will say it again. 1,000 days ago, I made the best choice of my life. I started nofap. While the struggles of the present and future may be great, through hard work, perseverance, and moral courage, we can make positive change to both ourselves and our society. This has been PaxTube. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video.